Join with me. Let's all take a deep breath and close our eyes. We see in the middle of our mind a little ball of golden light. We watch this light as it begins to grow, larger and larger. Until now, it covers the entire inner vision of our mind. We see for ourselves within this light a beautiful temple. We see a garden that surrounds the temple and a body of water that flows through the garden. We see that the inside of the temple is lit as well by this same beautiful golden light. And here we are, for we have been drawn together by the power and in the presence of God. We devote our time spent together, all of our relationships and experiences together to him. We pray that his holiest spirit be upon us, lifting us up, up above and beyond the sorrows, the limitations, and the fears of this world to the love and infinite peace that lay beyond. And so it is, together we all say, Amen. Tonight I want to talk to you about spiritual darkness and spiritual light. And that includes the power of the darkness and the power of the light. Spiritual darkness and spiritual light are not mere symbols. The light is defined in A Course in Miracles as understanding. To live in the light means to live with deep understanding. Darkness is the absence of light. Spiritual darkness means something we are not understanding. Now what is there for us to understand? Spiritual light is the understanding that number one, you are not a child of this earth. Your body is like a suit of clothes. Your physical birth was not the beginning of your life, but a continuation. Your physical death will not be the end of your life, but a continuation, number one. Number two, you are a thought in the mind of God. And A Course in Miracles says, if you have a problem with the idea that God is an idea, mind, it's because you have not yet accepted that you are an idea, mind. You are an idea, A Course says, in the mind of God. Number three, an idea cannot leave its source. This is why you cannot be separate from God, but it's also why if you're angry at someone else, you will feel attacked. Because any thought you have about anyone does not leave its source. This understanding, number one, of who you are, starts with who you are. It is about your eternal reality, your reality that does not and cannot change. Because what God creates is created eternally, and it is changeless. The body, once again, merely a suit of clothes. Next, God created us as one. This is the metaphysical meaning of the line, there is only one begotten son. There is one idea in the mind of God, one name of which is the sonship. Carl Jung talked about how if you go deep enough in your mind, deep enough in your mind, deep enough in yours and mine, there is a level of mental imagery all of us share. He called it the collective unconscious, and these mental images are archetypes. The notion of the Christ mind goes one level deeper, that if you go deep enough into your mind and deep enough into yours and deep enough into mine, it's not just that we contain the same imagery, it's that we are all of the same mind. Like the spokes on a wheel, we identify ourselves, as it were, with the position of the spokes on the rim. But the actual identity of the spoke is in the hub of the wheel, and at that there is only one point. So we've already discussed how you are one with God and cannot be separate from God. And because the sonship, one name of which is the Christ mind, 
is the identity we share, not only can we not be separate from God, we cannot be separate from each other. And next, that we have a purpose on this earth. The purpose on this, our purpose on this earth is to use the mind the way it was created by God to be used. God has a thought, and that thought comes into us because it is the source of who we are, and then when the mind is used the way it was created and intended to be used, the thought comes into us and goes right through us. So we extend it. The same, which is to say that the purpose of our lives, and that means any situation that we are in, is to extend love. And any time we find ourselves in a situation in which lovelessness appears to prevail, because light casts out darkness, if in any moment where fear appears to prevail, we think with love, that shift into loving thought will produce a miracle or a correction. That matrix of understanding is the light. And when we are within that light, we feel at home in this universe because that is what it means to be at home in this universe when I remember who I am. When I remember who I am, I remember that I am one with a, a higher being or God. I remember I am one with the universe. I, am remember, I remember that I am one with you. And I remember that I have a purpose here. Then I can be comfortable in my skin. Outside the circle, that circle of light, which is the same meaning as the exile from the garden, same meaning as what the Course in Miracles calls the detour into fear or the separation is when my mind has separated itself from that understanding. And when you step out of the light, in that light there is inner peace. In that light you can feel comfortable in your skin. In that light you know why you're in the world. You, relationships work out. You, life works. You know, the Course in Miracles, it's, it's as though it prides itself on being a practical course. This is not just some lofty theology that has nothing to do with our everyday moment-by-moment -moment experience. This is very practical. When I live outside that light, i.e., when I forget I no longer understand who I am, then I am cast into the outer regions of spiritual darkness, chaos, and randomness. And I don't know who I am. I don't know the purpose of my life. I don't know what the ultimate meaning of things is. I, I, I don't have any sense of my connection to anything higher than myself. And I go a little nuts inside because none of it makes sense. And the spirit can't be, feel comfortable in those regions of outer darkness. Now, there is a mind the spirit of fear, as it is called in the uh, New Testament. In The Course in Miracles, the word ego is used. Ego is the loveless mind. Now, how did the ego came to be, come to be? Well, The Course in Miracles says that this moment of separation occurred in time millions of years ago, in time as we know it, but in reality, it never even occurred because only love is real. And that is the deepest, ultimate, most fundamental understanding. That is the light, that only love is real. So this whole kingdom of spiritual darkness, of randomness, of chaos, of lovelessness, of fear in all its forms, is a gigantic mortal hallucination we are having. But that doesn't mean we don't feel it on a three-dimensional level. But all of the pain and the suffering of humanity comes because of humanity not being in its right mind, as Mahatma Gandhi said. All of the manifestations of horror on the planet come about because of spiritual darkness, because of the fact that we as human beings have forgotten that we are one with God, that we are one with each other. The spiritual journey is the path out of darkness and back to light. 
It is a path of awakening. That's why the great spiritual masters are called the awakened ones. They have awakened from the dream. The dream being this forgetfulness. I've fallen asleep to who I am. I've fallen asleep to my ultimate identity. I have fallen asleep to who I am in relationship to you. And in this dream, nightmares have come. Because the Course in Miracles says, you can misuse your mind. And the mind, as we were talking about before, was created to be used in love. But free will means free thought, means I can either remain in the light or I can step into darkness, right? Now the problem is that ego mind, i.e. fear, is the dominant consciousness of the planet on which we live. So from the time we're very, very little, we are taught an entire thought system of darkness. And that entire thought system of darkness is held in place by the evidence of our physical senses. Because the physical senses are the body's eyes and the body's ears. It's what we touch, feel, all, everything evidenced by our physical senses. So, in the realm of spirit or light, which is a quantum field beyond time and space, as Einstein said, time and space are illusions of consciousness. He said, it's an uh, illusion, albeit a persistent one. So my physical eyes tell me you're over there and I'm over here. My physical eyes tell me you're over in that body and I'm over in this, therefore we are separate. Now if I think that, if I think that you are separate from me, I'm actually blind in that moment. I, I do not have the light to guide me. And that will lead me to do stupid things in my relationship with you. Once again, keep it practical. I'm not, I, I, I don't see. In the Greek tragedy of Oedipus, Oedipus slept with his mother and killed his father. Now, sleeping with your mother, that's exactly what's happened to human consciousness. The earth is our mother. She gave birth to us as human beings, but now we have an inappropriate relationship with the earth. We are bonded in ways we should not be. And this, and, and concomitantly, we have killed the father. So the father is the spirit, the mother is the earth. That's why, you know, sometimes people have a hard time with, you know, they feel there's something anti-feminist or something about calling God he, but you want to remember that in the Eastern religions, the yin is feminine and earth, and the yang is masculine and spirit. We call Mother Earth. And I've never heard a man say, why don't we call it Father Mother Earth? <laughs> and that's because instinctively we relate to the earth as a feminine force. So the idea of Oedipus is that he, he killed the father. You, you annihilate that. Now remember, you are one with God. So to annihilate God, to repudiate God, i.e. to repudiate love, is to repudiate yourself. So every loveless thought is an act of psychic self-annihilation. And we are constantly annihilating ourselves. Now, now look at the state of the planet. Somebody was pointing this out to me the other day. I thought it was a very good point. Humanity is the only species involved in systematically in its own destruction. We are systematically destroying our own habitat. What species does this? And we are systematically at war with each other. But all of that is an outpicturing of the consciousness that dominates the planet in which we are constantly at war with ourselves. So then you say, well, why would I choose to dwell with, in darkness? Why would I do that? Why would I be constantly repudiating myself? Because the ego does not come up and say, hi, I'm your self-hatred. <laughs> it poses as your self-love. It poses, it's just like for those of you familiar with the 12 steps, the idea that, that addiction is sly and insidious disease. It is a sly, progressive, insidious disease. The way the, 
the, in all Christianity, the notion of the silver-tongued devil. The ego is very wily. Why? Because it is your own power turned against you. It is very insidious. When you have done the most self-sabotaging things, at the moment you did them, you probably thought it was a good idea and just something that you had to do because you had to set a boundary and take care of yourself. <laughs> and it was six months or a year before you went, oh my God, why did I say that? Right? Exactly, because the ego, you make your biggest mistakes and it kind of seemed like a good idea at the time. And then the same ego mind, which sets you up to do the wrong thing, punishes you savagely for having done so. And you have to like be on the path for a while before you say to it, you're the one who told me to do this. <laughs> that same voice. So the idea of the power of the darkness and the power of the light. You can misuse your mind i.e. think without love. But what you cannot do, the Course says, is diminish its power. So every thought, the Course says, creates form on some level. So the law of cause and effect, called in the East karma, in the West the law of cause and effect, the Course in Miracles says this is the building block, basically, of the universe. God created it for our protection. Once God creates something, it cannot be uncreated. You cannot ask God to bend the rules for you. So the law of cause and effect means every thought is a cause that will have an effect. And what we tend to do on this planet is we go around asking God to change the effects. But God will not change the effects. What he will do, the Course says, is work with you should you request it on the level of cause. So if you're thinking crazy, and you're thinking without love, and you're not forgiving people, and you're not atoning for your own mistakes, and you're not rising to the occasion in your life, and, and you are not a vessel of love, and you're all about give me rather than what I can give, then your life will not work. So if you ask God, well, could you make my life work? The way God makes our life work, the answer is number one, yes. And then it will seem like things get worse. What really happened? God saying, well, you asked me to make your life better. So you said, well, I asked you to make it better, not make it worse. And the answer is, well, we had to put a magnifying glass on all the crazy things you're doing to make it so bad. <laughs> so what happens is it seems to get worse. It didn't actually get worse, but the magnifying glass is put so that you see your own contribution to making it not work. Does that make sense? then it would be a violation of our free will for God to enter into the level of cause unless we request it. Because if I want to be crazy, I can be crazy. If I want to stay in anger, I can do that. If I want to stay in control, I, in controlling stuff, I can do that. If I want to stay in setting an agenda for other people, I can do that. If I want to act all needy and out of my wounds and my neurotic patterns, I can do that. Life's not going to work, but I can do that. God himself will not, will not make me stop. Although the Course does say there is a limit beyond which the Son of God cannot miscreate, which is to say you go around doing that long enough, you will bottom out, which... We know, right? Okay. But should we request it? Should we request it? One name for what we are given then, the Course in Miracles says, the moment, millions of years ago in time as we know it, although in reality it never occurred at all, when the Son of God, that moment that the Course in Miracles calls the moment when the Son of God forgot to laugh. In that moment or that detour into fear, God, the Course says, because God answers every problem the moment the problem occurs, created within our mind a bridge back to correct perception should we request it. That is called in the Course the internal teacher. One name for it is the Holy Spirit. What it means is that if I have manufactured illusion, because every thought that is not love manufactures an illusion. So if I'm in a loveless thought, a loveless state, I am in illusion. So it be, your healing begins by knowing if I'm not happy, I'm not seeing correctly. If I'm not happy, it's because I'm seeing darkness instead of light. So you don't ask that situations within the darkness change. 
you ask to see the light. Because situations don't change because you try to make them change. Because all that situations on the outside are, are like projections onto a screen at a movie. If you don't like what's going on in a movie, you can't go up to the screen and change it. It's all a projection of your own thinking. So when you invite the Holy Spirit in, and this is why the, the prayer that's said so often as we seek to be miracle workers, I am willing to see this differently. I am willing to see this differently. I am willing to see this differently. What that means is my hands, my eyes, my ears, my mortal mind, and everybody I know, and all of the input of the culture in which I live is showing me darkness. It is showing me that it, my brother's guilt, and the ego mind, all mind is driving itself more because the mind is always expanding. So loving thought is always expanding, but so is fearful thought. And once again, you can misuse your mind, but you cannot diminish its power. So the ego mind, the Course says, which is the mind that repudiates love. It's this vast illusion, this hallucinatory matrix of thought is like a scavenger dog, and it is always on the lookout for any scrap of your brother's guilt, the Course says. Because as long as I am attacking you, who am I attacking? Me. Because mine does not leave, an idea does not leave its source. The Holy Spirit's goal is heaven, which is not a condition or a place, it is an awareness of our oneness. <sighs> this is heaven. What is the ego's goal? Hell, which is what the ego would make of any moment. When you have convinced yourself you're separate from other people, they're out to get you, it's a dangerous world, your, your life would be better if only they did different. The spirit is here to say, look, only one thing's going on here, and that is that you love them and they love you. And your mind is gonna go into what they're not doing right all the time, but that's your ego mind by definition. When really the issue is, what about you here? What part are you playing? And as you atone for your mistakes, you don't even have to forgive them for theirs because you're not affected by theirs anymore because once you let them off the hook, you're off the hook. It's not that they need to change. So the ego mind is always seeking your anxiety, your depression, and this whole thing about depression, the whole mindset of the world in which we now live is depressing because it is constantly casting us out of the light of our own true being. And that's what the spiritual path is every single day. Now, The Course in Miracles says each and every one of us has a highly individualized curriculum. Well, what does that mean? What that means is that the universe is intentional and the universe is intentional, God loves. And the Course in Miracles says, God is the mind of love, never deviates from love, and the universe, as the handwriting of God, is always self-organizing, meaning love knows what to do, and it is self-correcting. So even if, through my thought or your thought or anybody's thought, loveless thinking has been introduced into the ethers, the universe is like a GPS, God being perfect, having the answer to every problem the moment the problem occurs, even when there is lovelessness introduced into the system, the universe knows how to absolutely get it back on track, like a GPS, recalibrate, as long as the mind remains in love. So I, the Course in Miracles says, you were not born to be at the effect of lovelessness either in your own mind or in anyone's mind. So the problem is we dwell in darkness. And if you wake up in the morning and you give yourself over to the interpretation of the world, the way the newspaper reveals it to you, go straight for the internet, go straight for the newspaper, new, you know, the TV, whatever, and you download the consciousness of the world and the interpretation of the world that now dominates this world, you will not be happy. And so what we want to be clear about as spiritual seekers is there's no mystery to that, right? There's no mystery to that. The only return to happiness is the opening of the inner eye. You can call this the third eye. You can call it the vision of the Holy Spirit. Whatever, 
It is the idea that in any given moment, I can see this differently. Now, this is no different than in our lives all the time. You go through something and a friend says, well, you can look at it that way, but you could also look at it differently. I mean, we do this all the time. It's that same concept taken to everything. Well, you could look at it this way, but you could look at it another way. Now, to the ego mind, the ego will do anything to lure you away from love. And it does this by positing that love is weakness. And if you're in love, if your mind is in love, if your mind is in, is in forgiveness, you will be weak and you will be taken advantage of. And you won't be clear and you won't be good in business and they'll, uh, whatever. And you'll be a doormat. But that's the ego's lies. Because the truth of the matter is, your loving mind is your whole mind. The whole mind is the holy mind. If I'm not, if I'm in a full state of love, that means that I have my whole self. I am in command. When God, i.e. love, is on the throne of my mind, I'm on the throne in my life. But when God, i.e. love, is not on the throne in my mind, then I will not be on the throne in my life. But the ego is very insidious. And so the ego's dictate is seek but do not find. One of the things the ego is always telling us, oh, I'm just looking for love. How many times in one way or the other is your basic message to someone, I'm just being this way because I want us to have a relationship. I'm only on you like this because I'm trying to get you to show up for this relationship. Who's not showing up for the relationship in that moment? I just want you to be different so we can love each other. <laughs> right? So you see how we do this in intimate relationships. We also do it in business. We do it in any area where we think that there is any goal here other than love. And this is what in the Ten Commandments, put no gods before me. We put other gods before God all the time on this planet. We are a nation, we are a civilization of idolaters. That's what idolatry is. Idolatry is where you think that there's something out there that is the source of your happiness. Once again, Oedipus sleeping with the mother. We have an inappropriate bonding with the forces of the earth. So the forces of the earth aren't even your true self. The first noble truth, the second noble truth, I think in Buddhism, is that the things of this world can only bring temporary happiness. But the ego mind says, you'll be happy when you make this or that happen on the mortal plane. You'll get this money, or you'll get that job, or you'll get that house, or you'll get that car, or you'll make this happen, then you will be happy. All of this is the, the ego mind tempting you into darkness. Why? Because what it means is that you'll constantly be grasping, constantly be struggling. Why? Because if I do that, I'll be happy. So then you're either unhappy because you haven't gotten it yet, or you get it, and for about 10, 15 minutes, you'll be happy. And then, as Buddha said, the things of this world will only bring you temporary happiness. So you say, wait, I got it, and I'm not happy, to which the ego mind responds, huh, you need more, so that you'll get back on the wheel, or you need different. And that is because we idolize the material plane. Now, once again, it's not, it, yes, is it a theological construct? Yes. But we're at a point in our development where this stuff, you can see that it's common sense. If you look around this room, and this is all there is, that's kind of disappointing. And we all know that. It's like, really, this is just, this is it? The point is, no, this is not it. This is only a shimmer. And the Course in Miracles is not saying that the material plane is bad. It's that the material plane in and of itself is nothing. It's just a screen. It's not that it's a good movie or a bad movie. It's just a screen. It, it's nothing of itself. Whether the things of this world are holy or unholy, the Course in Miracles says, is determined solely by the purpose that the mind ascribes to it. So the body itself, for instance, the Course in Miracles says, the body itself is, is of itself nothing, but it is a beautiful lesson in communion until communion is. So the things of this world, the Course in Miracles is not saying that the things of this world are bad. 
It's saying the things of this world are either a reflection of the spirit, which is love, or a reflection of, of, of fear. So, you know, sometimes I'll see on Facebook, oh, people get so upset with me because I'll make a political post. Oh, that's just of the illusion and we're supposed to ignore it. Well, you could say that about anything. Uh, anything is an illusion. These lectures are an illusion. Anything of the material world is an illusion. We're not here to ignore the illusion. We are here to transform the illusion from fear to love. We are here to, to achieve what the Course in Miracles calls the highest level of thinking of which the ego is capable. So, we're a bunch of bodies sitting around talking tonight. Is this happening theologically within the realm of the illusion? Absolutely. But we're talking about love, and we're trying to get to love in our lives, which means it's a higher level of illusion. We could be sitting around talking about hate. It's still within the illusion. Now, awakening, the Course in Miracles says you don't go straight from the nightmare to the awakening. See, that's what, when people say, oh, you just leave it alone, you don't engage it. The Course in Miracles makes it very clear. That would not be called transcendence. That would not be called miraculous. That would be called denial. Now, the Course in Miracles talks about the difference between positive denial and negative denial. The Course talks about positive denial, which is you don't deny that it's happening. But you deny that this is the end of the story, right? The abolitionists didn't deny that slavery was happening. The suffragettes didn't deny the injustice of not giving women the right to vote. You don't deny injustice. You deny that that's the end of the story. Why? Because you're here. And it, whatever that formation or manifestation of lovelessness might have material power, it might have money behind it, it might have technology behind it, it might have governments behind it, but if it does not have love behind it, it is no match for you. And so positive denial is, oh, I see you. I don't deny your mortal manifestation. I deny your power over me. But if I inappropriately sleep with the mother, i.e. have my own sense of self tied up with only the material world, I am blind to my own power because I've given my power over to my false self. So then when I see the false powers of the world, they scare me and I think they're more powerful than me. To the extent to which I identify not with this world, but with the love that is the truth of who we are, then you reclaim your power. Your love is not your weakness. Your love is your power. And then, and then you stand in front of the manifestations of the world and you deny their power over you. This is why so many of the great social justice movements of the world emanated from the churches, emanated from great religious and spiritual systems. Abolition, so grounded in the Quakers, Suffragette, many of the leaders of the suffragette movement were Quakers, the civil rights movement. Dr. King was a Baptist preacher, the Southern Christian leadership. So many of the great, the great, why? Because of two things. Number one, when you see, when you have genuinely religious, and by religious here, we're not talking about dogma and doctrine. We're talking about fervor of the gut and of the heart. When that is your connectivity to a sense of who you truly are, you see loveless manifestation and you are very clear, this is not the way it's supposed to be. You are very clear that this earth is meant to be a reflection of love. And it becomes, the more you stand on that ground, the more intolerable it becomes for you. That was so profound about the abolitionists. Slavery was intolerable. Other people said, yeah, you know, it probably shouldn't exist. But slavery didn't end because of people who thought it shouldn't exist. You have those who were slaves were obviously limited in their capacity, right? the slave population, and in the population that was not slaves, it wasn't going to end because of people who went, yeah, this really shouldn't happen. No, to actually, it was those who found its existence intolerable. That, because the Course in Miracles says miracles arise from conviction. But when you come at the issues of transforming the world from a miracle-minded place, you don't just come from a sense that what is is intolerable, you have even greater power than that. You have the absolute conviction that something else is possible.
that something else is possible. Yes, it will take a miracle, but that's what God does naturally as expressions of love. So we are all meant, the Course in Miracles says, to be miracle workers. We are here to stand within the space of our own lives and to know if something is happening here that is not of love, there is a reason for this. And that means because my individual curriculum, and it's so interesting when you look at the world because obviously we have things where this is just your curriculum and this is your curriculum or your curriculum, your relationships, my relationships, we all have our individual issues and relationships in life. But then there are also collective curriculums that nations are going through or ethnic groups are going through and all of that kind of stuff. Curriculum that, curricula that are collective. The point is to know that a curriculum is a set of lessons. The universe is intentional. The universe is intentional that that embryo becomes the baby. It is intentional that the bud become the blossom. It is intentional that the acorn become an oak tree. And it is intentional that all of us rise out of the mire, the darkness, the craziness, the neuroses, the woundedness of our spiritual confusion. It is God's will, i.e. the intention of the universe, that we awaken. And every situation we find ourselves in, the Course in Miracles says, is perfectly planned. It is a lesson that offers us the invitation and the challenge to awaken. Now, the ego mind, this is what the ego mind says to this. Well, that's what I've been trying to tell the other, other person the, other, the whole time. Because if they would awaken, you see, this would be fun. And then the course comes back and says, well, actually, this, I didn't mean this was about their awakening. Yes, everybody in the situation has their awakening, but that one is not the lesson you are being asked to learn. In fact, one of the lessons you are being asked to learn is to stop thinking that it's your job to tell other people what their lesson is. Right? Your lesson is to vigilantly monitor yourself. And that becomes the nature of every day. And when, when it does become the nature of every day, you don't have time to monitor other people. You're busy, how'd I do? How'd I do in that last conversation? How did I do in that, in that last hour? How did I do in that meeting? You know, I once read a woman who wrote, I don't remember her name, she said, in youth you learn, in age you understand. You know, you get to a point in your life where you're just thinking all the time about how you did the 90s. <laughs> you know, like how, how, because whatever time you have left, all that any lesson is, is a repeat of the last one. That's A Course in Miracles says that. All that life is, is a set of lessons faithfully rehearsed. And so the ego mind says, why do I keep meeting people like that? Right? As though the problem is not, or it's very sly there. Because it's actually, a, it's almost this pretense, well, the problem is with me. But it's not. It's very sly. Because it's still indicating that the problem is with them. Your only problem is that you are attracted to them. Right? So there's no real ownership there. Right? So why do you keep meeting them? Because you have not yet learned the lesson. Now, it might be to cross the street as soon as you meet a person like that. It might be that. But it might be to be different within that situation. Even if being different within that situation means knowing, I don't need to be here. And so every day of our lives becomes about, am I living in the darkness or am I living in the light? Now, that light, as we were saying before, the light of love is the light of your power. Living in spiritual light. The ego mind has come up with this idea that if you give your life to love, that you will be disempowered. And Christianity, of all the world's religions, Christianity is the one that has introduced that thought. Do I wanna, do I wanna live for God, or do I wanna be happy? <laughs> right? As though if I live for God, that will be the life of sacrifice. And that will be the life of less power. And that will be the life where I'm cast aside and I come in second all the time. But the Course in Miracles says, the meek shall inherit the earth because their strength will take the place over. Do you think that all these nuclear bombs, are, this is, or the way we treat the planet, 
all this loveless behavior is the way to sustain life on Earth? All the things that pose as power on this planet and constitute an entire matrix of systematic destruction of our planet and our species, that's power, that's insanity. And sometimes you have to wake up and see, lovelessness is insanity. But it says, no, 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 there's so much money behind this, it can't be insanity. There are so many governments agreeing on it, it can't be insanity. There's so much officialdom backing it up, it can't be insanity. And you know, any time, when you see some of the hugest manifestations, that's part of the game that the ego plays. Look at something like slavery. The, aboli the, the Quakers had nothing. The abolitionists came for the Quakers, they would just see simple people who sat there in silence and saw the light. This was, slavery was an economic, a huge economic system that had been placed for, in place for hundreds of years. You can't change this, that's what the ego would say. And then we're living very much through a time like this right now. It just like, you, you see some of the manifestations of craziness on the planet today. And it is very simple to go, we're cooked. Whether it has to do with environmental craziness or terrorism, we're all cowering here because we think it has power. But the power of the darkness has no power before the power of the light because in the presence of light, darkness disappears. And in the same way, in the presence of love, fear disappears. Just as when we were children, we were taught about evolution. It wasn't that the majority of the species, you know, when you have a species that comes to a point where its behavior is maladaptive for its survival. We learned this as kids. Either that species would go extinct or a mutation would occur. And then the descendants of the mutation, even though they were not the rep in any way even close to the majority of the species, because their behavior represented a survivable option, the entire species moves in that direction or they go extinct. And that's what's happened to our planet on the Earth within this illusion, within this dream. Our collective behavior is maladaptive for our survival on the planet. The mutations are the Jesus, the Moses, the Buddha, the Muhammad, the, the, all the great avatars and spiritual masters represent the mutations, which means represents those who have actually actualized. That's what they represent. They are those who have actualized the potential that lies within us all. They are those whose eyes have been awakened. They are the awakened ones. That's why they are called the enlightened ones. They have seen the light. And they, because their mind, if your mind is filled with light, i.e. if your mind was filled with love, the Course in Miracles says miracles occur naturally as expressions of love. So this is the deal. The universe is self-organizing, meaning I love you, you love me, we're going to just keep going on and this thing's just going to get better and better and better and better. But then on the other hand, the only reason we met was so that your childhood wounds could rub up against my childhood wounds. So actually some lovelessness is going to come up with you and some lovelessness is going to come up with me. But the universe is self correcting as well as self-organizing. So if we use this experience as an opportunity where both of us see our wounds and, and take responsibility for our part, and practice mercy and compassion towards the other person as they seek to take responsibility for theirs, then the universe corrects itself and the miracle occurs. So what's happening now on the planet is that we have the mutations. And sometimes we get very nervous because we, we look at a room like this and you could, certainly there are millions of people on the planet who in their own way are having the same kind of conversation we're having here tonight. And the, the ego mind goes, yeah, well, that's a few million, but it's a few billion on the planet. And look how the darkness is so bolstered by money, economies, uh, governmental agreement, the entire agreement of the species. But you don't, you don't have to worry about that. The, uh, the majority didn't wake up and say, let's free the slaves. The majority didn't wake up one day and say, let's give women the right to vote. It is not, the power that changes the world is not on the vertical, excuse me, is not on the horizontal, it's on the vertical. It's not how many people you try to convince. Because if you're trying to change the world by convincing more people, then you're tempted to dumb down the message all the time. 
So the issue, the Course in Miracles says, the primary responsibility of the miracle worker is to accept the atonement for himself. You don't try to convince anyone. It's how deep you go. It's vertical, not horizontal. Then the deeper you go into practicing this, what this does is that people around you who are, you know, there's a, a phrase in a, a James Joyce book, almosting it. We are attracted to people who are half a step ahead. Because the person who is half a step ahead in, in any area, I'm almosting it, but you're embodying it. But if I was more, if you were more, this is one of the things I love in the course. It says, don't worry that you're not further ahead than you are. Because you are going to be sent to people who are only half a step behind you. And if you were any further ahead, who would teach them? Right? And all of us are teachers and all of us are students. So you're always finding yourself with people with your little half a step ahead. What does that mean? You're not as triggered. You're not as wounded. You had a different childhood. And you're also with people who are half a step behind. Same thing. And it's not, and I see this in my life. It's so interesting. It's not like some of us are ahead and some of us are behind. I see this in my close relationships. In this area, you're ahead. In that area, I'm ahead depending on what your childhood experience was versus what my childhood experience was, right? And that's why friends often, you know, I'm strong in this one and you're, I'm weaker in this one, right? So the issue becomes knowing that in any situation, we are called to stand in the light. And that means, number one, you wake up in the morning. You know, there's discipline involved here. Just like you go to the gym to, to, to hone your physical muscles, you hone your attitudinal muscles. And it takes discipline. And if I, atone, if I hone my physical muscles through physical exercise, I counter gravity. That's what physical exercise is. Accumulated repetitions where I then can build the musculature to counter the physical gravity. The same is the parallel truth on the inner planes is the psychological gravity, the emotional gravity of anger, of cynicism of all forms of lack of impeccability and ethics, and, and we just become sloppy. That's what a life not well lived is. It's sloppy. We are emotionally sloppy. We are psychologically sloppy. The Course in Miracles says you achieve so little because you have undisciplined minds. If I'm not doing repeated repetitions to keep my thought forms high, just like if I'm not doing repeated repetition of anti-gravitational stuff with weights for my body, gravity is pulling my muscles down. If I'm not doing repeated accumulations of spiritual exercise through meditation, for those of us who are students of the course, the reading, the workbook, and so forth, then emotional and psychological gravity is dragging you down. And your attitudinal muscles become flabby. And just like without strong physical muscles, we can't move without strong internal musculature, emotionally and psychologically, we can't be still and we become reactive, and we get scared, and we spin out, and this weakens us. It's about strong mus muscles versus weak muscles. And if you have strong muscles, you can not only carry yourself, you can help carry others. And if you have strong spiritual muscles, you not only know how to stand yourself within the fires and the tribulations of life, but you know how to carry others as well. Now, we're living at a time where the collective manifestations of ego are very intense. And if you allow yourself to be carried away by it, um, you can be. Each and every day, all of us are absolutely bombarded by a constant barrage of stimulus that ranges from the meaningless to the genuinely heinous. These, humanity is having a, 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 humanity itself is having a nervous breakdown. And the fact that these are disturbing times does not mean something's wrong with you. That's what my latest book is about. The fact that you are disturbed by all this does not mean you have a disorder. You are disturbed because these are deeply disturbing times. Would we be better off had the abolitionists just not gotten so upset? Would we be better off if, you know, I loved it. I got a Facebook post last night from somebody who, you know, I got all this criticism because how dare you talk about politics? And then somebody said, Martin Luther King didn't have a political agenda. Gandhi didn't have a political agenda. I'm like, what are you talking about? 
politics is just a relationship, just like any other, but it's relationships between and among groups of people. But in order to stand within any relationship and not get spun into the darkness that you are co-creating, it takes practice. And so the, this is not just about so your life can work better. It's so that our lives can work better so that then we can become conduits by which we are able co-creating with each other and with God to answer the collective challenges of the times in which we live. And you know, that's why, once again, this whole conversation that we've been having and that I, I wrote about over the last year, that if you don't go through your own turbulent times, if you don't know how to navigate the turbulent times in your own life, which simply means if you don't know how to stand strong in the light in the midst of the darkness swirling around you in your individual life, then you don't know how to navigate life because those disturbances are the lessons that we go through as part of our curriculum to, to, in order to achieve the place where we can remain strong. A story I tell in the book, or in the Buddhist section, one of my favorite stories in the Buddhist lore is about a Buddhist monk who, several monks were living in their monastery, and a warlord decided that he was taking over all of that territory, and he sent his minions to tell all of the monks in the monastery that they had to leave now because he was taking it over. The minions went in. They told all the monks they would have to leave now. Warlord was taking the monastery as his own property. All of the monks fled except for one who informed the minion that he would not be leaving. So the minion gets on his horse, rides back to the warlord and said, well, we do have one problem here. There's one monk who refuses to leave. And the warlord said, what do you mean he refuses to leave? So, well, he, I told him that you were taking over and that he had to leave and he said he wasn't leaving. He said, did you tell him that this means we will kill them if they do not leave? He said, yes, but he said he's not leaving. So the warlord was really curious. What kind of person is going to say, I'm not leaving when we've told them we will kill them if we don't leave, if they don't leave? So the warlord decided himself, gets off his horse and goes into the monastery and says to this monk, did you not get the message? You must leave now. And the, minion, and the monk said, I, I got the message, but I'm not leaving. And the warlords took out his sword, and he put the tip of it right under the chin of the monk. And he said, do you not understand? I could split you in two. I could just take the sword and split you in two. Perhaps you don't understand that. And the monk said to the warlord, perhaps you do not understand. I could let you. At that, the warlord throws down his sword, bows before the monk. He realizes he has been in the presence of an enlightened master and thus begins his spiritual journey. In other words, the monk, what, what you do to me on the physical plane, I'm just not afraid of it. But what's so interesting is when he stood in that place, where his mind was not drawn to the craziness of this world, he was firm within the light of his spiritual truth, then the material plane bowed to him. This did not weaken him before the warlord. This completely shifted the, the relationship of power, and the power was then in the monk's hand. And that's the same thing as in the New Testament. When, when the Christ child is born, the kings bow to the Christ child in you. So the ego says you will be disempowered in the world if you are enlightened. Now, you can call it nirvana, you can call it enlightenment, you can call it the promised land, you can call it resurrection, you can call it self-actualization. You can talk about it in religious and spiritual terms or in secular terms of the hero's journey. It doesn't matter. The Course in Miracles describes that state as inner peace. But you don't have to go, what the ego mind says is, I need to go change all the circumstances and then I will be at peace. The spirit says, no, you find your peace and the circumstances will fall into place. That is our calling. That is the calling of each and every circumstance that we are in. And so before we even do the meditation, is there anybody 
based on anything that I've said, just if, only, only if it's based on stuff that we're talking about here tonight, only within the container of this particular conversation, is there anybody who has a yeah but? Anybody have a yeah but? Anybody have a specific question about what we're talking about here? Yes, sir, one. I'm sorry? What's the purpose? What's the purpose? Of the 3D illusion. Okay. Ego, okay. What, what is the purpose of all this? <clears throat> the Course in Miracles answers that question by saying, that is the kind of question the ego would ask. <laughs> <laughs> it says, do not let questions of theology delay you go directly for, for the experience. In other words, nobody can give you a rational explanation for a moment of irrationality. So this is the deal. There is no time. So when you ask me, what is the purpose of this? Because all the time is is a reenactment, this is my answer to you. Is there anybody in your life that you have not fully forgiven? Yes. Would you say that you are holding on to some resentment or a grudge towards that person? Yes. My question to you is, what is the purpose of that? If you can tell me what purpose there is in your life to holding on to this, to withholding your love from that person, if you can answer that question, you've answered the question. Because any moment of, of, of lovelessness, the Course says, is a reenactment of that original mistake. Does that make sense? Okay, now I'm gonna ask Richard, the beloved Richard, to come up here with us. Adam, if you're watching, we're waiting for you too, and I want you to think you're cast out of our love. Richard, you wanna come be with us? And... Okay, now, so let's go over this before we even, you know, the Course in Miracles says, complexity is of the ego. Spiritual, spiritual truth is simple. That doesn't mean it's simplistic. There's a difference between simple and simplistic. And it also doesn't mean it's easy. But what you come to realize is that it's not that living this way is difficult. What's difficult is getting over our resistance to living this way. He says in the Course, my way is not difficult, my way is different. So if I look at you and I choose to just give you the benefit of the doubt, if I look at you and I realize, like let's say you were my husband and you didn't call when you said you were going to call. My one way of looking at it is he does not keep his agreements, he does this to me all the time, he never does it when he says he's going to do it. That's one way I can look at it. That's one mental filter. It's the filter of judgment. There's another mental filter which is that he was working and this has nothing to do with you. And the real problem here is that you don't understand that he has his patterns and his rhythms and you're demanding he call you at a certain time without any respect for whether or not that fit into his rhythms. That was what went wrong here. But that second way, it, it takes a muscle, it takes an emotional, psychological muscle to develop it. Now, look where the mind goes with that. The, the ego mind goes, well, that's that's just ridiculous, and you, then you have no boundaries and you'll get walked all over. This course comes back and goes, no, the first scenario is one in which you will ruin the relationship. The second scenario is one in which you're actually cultivating love. But that's what the ego does, seek but do not find. The dictate, it's very insidious. We've talked here before about how you go to a therapist and the therapist who's practicing therapy without the spiritual dimension might say, is this relationship really giving you everything you need? <laughs> now, note what the spiritual-minded therapist would say, okay, are you giving to the relationship everything that you can? Now, it's, it's not difficult, but look how different they are. And look at the difficulty of giving into that second way. Because we go, oh, no, no, I'll, I'll just be taken advantage of. No, the first way you'll be taken advantage of, you'll never know love. If you go around with every relationship asking whether or not it's giving you what you need. And that's what the ego is. And the ego gets so much social support. 
right? And in our crowd, the higher consciousness crowd, you know, we wear as much as anybody because we are so sophisticated in our labeling and our jargon, right? And you're talking to your therapist about why you attracted someone like that. They're their therapist wondering why they attracted you. <laughs> right? Because everybody's somebody's stuff. So. <laughs> like, hello. So, life is complicated. Truth is simple. So why do you come somewhere like being here tonight? You are, each and every one of us, you have your highly individualized curriculum, and it's complicated. Life is complicated. But when you come to study spiritual principle, you want to study the truth, which is simple, so that then you take it out with you into the complicated situations. So as we started tonight, only love is real. Everything else is an illusion. Everything you're experiencing on the mortal plane is just a dance. It's just a shimmer. It's not the truth of what's actually going on. What's actually going on is that they love you whether they know it or not. And you love them whether you know it or not. And your ego mind is going nuts because they're not doing it the way you want them to. And the ego doesn't want you to look at your own opportunity for growth here. And anything that the other person did, either it was love, in which case the appropriate response is to love them, or they withheld love from you, which you are to interpret as a call for love. Because love is the ultimate reality. Your seeing things this way makes you a miracle worker. It does not weaken you, it strengthens you. It does not mean you won't have the capacity to leave a situation. Doesn't mean you won't have a capacity to set a healthy boundary. It doesn't mean you will get all foggy. It means you will get very, very clear. And it means that those situations will be miraculously healed. And it means that you will become someone capable of helping to work miracles in every situation in which you find yourself. So when we do this meditation this evening, allow your mind to travel to the situations in your life. When you study spirituality, you're not studying something over here while your life is over there. In fact, the Course says you can't bring the light to the darkness, you have to bring the darkness to the light. So when we talk about these principles and then we go into our meditative time, allow your life to come up in your awareness. And the question tonight is, where am I standing in the light and where am I in the darkness? Am I accepting people completely as they are or am I judging people? Am I atoning for my own errors or am I self-righteously taking a stand that, no, I'm right? Am I taking responsibility for my own part in situations or am I casting the blame on other people? Anger, defensiveness, attack, that is the way of the ego, it is the way of spiritual darkness. The Course in Miracles says the ego is suspicious at best and vicious at worst. Just like in Alcoholics Anonymous, when you learn about alcoholism or addiction, it's not just out to inconvenience you, it's out to kill you. And the collective ego is not just out to inconvenience the human race, it's out to kill us. The crazy mind is the destructive mind. It sends us to hell, not after we die, right here, right now. And the spirit is the light that will guide us, guide our thinking, which will then guide our behavior in ways that bring not only our own hearts and minds, but the world around us back into right alignment with truth and harmony and peace. Intellectually makes sense, right? Okay, let's pray. We rest into our seat and we close our eyes. And as we close our outer eye, the open eye is within. We call to mind all of the people in our lives. Everyone in our family, all of our friends, husband, wife, lover, friend, child, parent, 
people we work with, employer, employee, colleagues, associates, political figures, everybody who peoples our world, both on a personal level and together. And we simply ask ourselves, those are the outer circumstances, but am I living in the light? In the light means that each and every one of these people is receiving full beam our love. Each and every one of those people is receiving full beam our compassion. Each and every one of those people is receiving full beam our prayer for their happiness. Each of those people is receiving full beam our prayer that they be blessed and that they be loved. Every problem that we experience has the same answer. And that is that we ourselves open our eyes and see the light. Without self-condemnation, knowing fully the confusion that the ego mind casts upon us, we simply look at all of these people and we see all of the ways that we withhold love, we withhold forgiveness, we withhold approval, we withhold blessing. All of the ways in which we attack, all of the ways in which we blame, all of the ways in which we defend, all of the ways in which we judge and seek to control and have agendas for other people. And now we realize we can choose again. And we are willing. And in some of these cases, as we look at these people inside our minds, we go, well, that's easy. I, I, I was just in the habit of condemning that person. I was just in the habit of judging that person. I was in the habit of not forgiving. I can change that. That's easy. And allow yourself to actually see those people and bear witness to those relationships and allow your heart to open in places where you haven't. And knowing that no idea leaves its source, you realize that all the love you have been withholding from others, you have been withholding from yourself. And now there are those where it's just not easy. Where on the mortal plane they, they did do you wrong or they did betray you or they did undermine your success or they did abandon you, they, they did transgress. And in this case, with all the weight of that evidence, we pray for God's help. We pray that the Holy Spirit will come into our minds for we are willing to see this differently. Knowing that whatever anyone did to hurt us will be automatically healed if we keep our minds in love. We know that we are only hurting ourselves by continuing to withhold our forgiveness, by continuing to blame. But we can't make that change by ourselves. And on this one, we ask God's help. And now we think of all the, all the light that we have not allowed to be present in our lives. All the withholding of love that has been withholding 
of love from ourselves. And as we have withheld love, we have withheld from ourselves the experience of miracles. We have deflected so many miracles. But all of them have been held in trust for us by the Holy Spirit until we are ready to receive them. And so this night, as we open the aperture of our minds, allowing there to be light that was always there, but our eyes were closed. Tonight, we take our fingers from in front of our eyes. We stop complaining that it's dark in here. And we let so much love out to people and situations from whom we had been withholding it. Yes, even the political candidates. And we now allow ourselves to feel the love and the light, the power and the glory of this miraculous transformation within ourselves. For we have seen what we had not seen. And when we open our eyes, we shall be that much closer to the embodiment of the light that is who we truly are. A receiver of miracles and a giver of miracles. allowing our own minds to be healed that we might now help heal the world. If the Spirit of God has something of specific guidance to give you at this time, allow that to be. whatever message you are receiving. See whatever image is coming into your mind. Love as God would have you love. Forgive as God forgives you. Extend mercy as you feel his mercy upon you. Having touched this holy place within your mind, give thanks. Give praise. We say, Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Richard Lemon. My new book, Tears to Triumph, for those of you who have, have not, uh, thank you, thank you. I have also recorded 365 days of the workbook exercises of The Course in Miracles. If, if you would like those, you can find out about that at Marianne.com. I'm here in New York City on Wednesday nights, God willing, as my mother would say. This coming Sunday, I am speaking at uh, here. I am preaching with Jackie. Uh, at, at here at the Middle Collegiate Church at 11, and then we're doing something after as well. On Monday night, August 8th, I will be at the Barnes & Noble on Broadway and 82nd Street in conversation with Kelly Brogan, 
who is a psychiatrist who talks about depression, and we are both talking about depression, her from a uh, perspective of a psychiatrist and me spiritually. That will be on August 8th here in New York at Barnes & Noble. For those of you in Southern California, August 20th, I will be at Wanderlust in LA. On August 21st, I will be in Irvine at the International Conference on A Course in Miracles at 11 a.m. that night at the Center for Spiritual Living at the University Synagogue talking about my new book, and then on August 22nd at the Saban in Los Angeles. On August 27th, for those of you in Europe, I will be in London at the Conference for Consciousness and Human Evolution. All of these things are listed in, on Marianne.com, and if you're not on my e-list, I hope that you will uh, get on it so that... Um, uh, so that if there are changes or whatever is going on, articles I've written, et cetera, goes to you. And for those of you who do not know, uh, the book table and product table, all these lectures, uh, tonight's CD and so forth, all of that is in the back room. Okay, cool. And I want to take a moment to thank all the volunteers and also Nilu, who's been running things in, all of the wonderful, wonderful people, Harold, all the guys. Back there. Also, I'd like to talk to you for a moment about uh, my personal counseling. Um, because I'm here in New York, and usually people just kind of know it goes on, so I want to tell you what the story is on personal counseling. I do not charge. There is no exchange of money. But this is the deal. Um, it, it, you have to be a student of the Course in Miracles, or all that I would tell you is do the Course in Miracles. So uh, I, it's only if you've actually been doing the course, you're a serious student of the course, you've done the workbook for at least 30 days. And even then, only if you have a real serious issue to, to discuss, you know, if, to just kind of talk about things, work through some things. No, 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 I feel I've, you know, got the lectures and books and other people do that professionally. This is if you really have a, are a serious student of the Course in Miracles and are in a, in a serious situation of some kind that perhaps I could be um, of, of help uh, with you on. Uh, then do not hesitate to ask me, and it take, might take a little time, but I, I will certainly make myself available if that's the case, and also couples. It's not a continuous thing, but um, for couples, if, if I can be a, of use to you. So just uh, uh, let me know. Once again, it won't be continuous counseling, but if that one shot of uh, Course in Miracles Shakti would be of help to you, I will do my best. So if that's the case, if that speaks to anybody, just let me know. Um, uh, might not be immediately, but uh, that's what we'll do. Okay? All right. Let's talk about anything you want to talk about. Um, yes, ma'am. Lady in the red. Hi, Marianne. I have a question for you. It's kind of about politics. But I'm sorry I didn't hear a word you said. Oh, okay. okay. I have a question for you, actually, about politics. But first, I want to say, really, from the bottom of my heart, I think I probably speak for everyone here. Thank you so much for coming to New York. Oh, that's so sweet of you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Thank sure you. I'm not the only one who plans my Wednesday nights around this. Oh, thank and, you. And we're all busy New Yorkers, and I thank come here you. every time I've brought That's my friends. That's very kind of you to say. Yeah. Thank it's you so, so much. so helpful. Well, you're very kind. Um, <clears throat> that's true. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's true what I said. Yeah, they're both, they're both true. <laughs> Um, your political campaign, Yeah, I followed it, I was very interested in it because I followed you and Deepak Chopra for many years, uh -huh. I love both of you and, <clears throat> and other speakers. To me, I even sent you money. Thank you uh, very, very do. much. <laughs> now, I I'm eternally grateful to the many, many, many people who did, and if you're here, if you're online, uh, watching, whatever, I can't tell you what that means to me and how touched and honored I am. Well, I, I, I actually, I also sent you a song of mine called New Day, because to me, for your campaign, I, I thought it would be perfect. But I took the Alanis Morissette over yours. I know, Dang. I know, she's more famous than me. But um, to me, it was because I had followed so many consciousness speakers, and a lot of them, like you say, didn't want to get involved. You were jumping in. It was very different, very brave. Your big issue was get the money out of politics. Right. You said, I'm going to go in there. I don't care if they kick me out in two years. I'm going to get with Grayson. Be really loud and about that. Gonna, yeah. And I felt like this is what we need, people who don't need the money. They don't need the job. That's the cancer underlying all the other cancers is the undue influence of money on our politics right, right now. And I felt 
that there had been this shift, and yet you, you didn't win, and it was a disappointment for me. I want to know how you felt, what's your opinion, and what is your hope going forward? For well, I, I felt that it was legitimate to me to run for Congress, because I felt that my understanding of the issues was such that I could hit the ground running as Congresswoman on the first day because of my understanding on the issues. Yeah. I still believe that, and many people, including very well-positioned politicians who uh, endorsed my campaign, believe so as well. Mm -hmm. What I vastly underestimated was the significance of the fact that I had never participated in an actual, or since I was 17 years old, an actual political campaign. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, well, that's simple. You just, you, you raise money and then you hire someone to do that. And that was very naive on my part. That's not the way it works at all. Mm -hmm. And now, if I was 10 years younger, I mean, many, many people, including Barack Obama, lost his first congressional race. Uh, many people uh, lose their first campaigns and that's where they learn how to do it. That's not my path. I don't feel not any ounce of me feels that. Um, like I said, if I was much younger, maybe I would say give me 10 years to get over it. So I don't see it happening that way. But, and for that reason, I was deeply disappointed in myself. You know, and I, I was very sad about that. And I was, in fact, that's a large part of what that, that book really came out of. Mm -hmm. um, but my passion for the issues uh, didn't in any way, were not in any way diminished. And everything that I did stand for in that campaign was certainly amplified in the presidential campaign of Bernie Sanders. Mm -hmm. um, and I was a passionate uh, uh, supporter of Bernie Sanders uh, when he was running. Um, I feel just as strongly as I ever did. Uh, the undue influence of money on our politics is the uh, underlying cancer under all the other cancers. It is the moral, genera moral challenge of our generation to get the money out of politics. It has turned us, really it has destroyed our democracy. We are functioning more as a plutocracy or an oligarchy. And um, uh, overturning Citizens United I think is more important than anything else. And I think it is worth noting that Hillary Clinton has said uh, that in her first 100 days, uh, she would be submitting a constitutional amendment that would, un, uh, that would overturn Citizens United. So, uh, and I think that that's one of the many ways in which she has been pushed uh, by the Bernie campaign. That's not the kind of thing Hillary was saying uh, before the Bernie campaign. But do, you see, do you see or have hope for other of your um, friends who are in your line of work well, it's not for me to say how other people run. It is my hope. This is about America. This is not about individuals. This is about these are issues for all of us. And as far as people in my own profession and my colleagues, um, I happen to know them. And in the like in their own lives, they're very very hipper people than you'd even know most of them. But whether somebody chooses to be out there saying those things or not is their business. As, you know, as a course in miracle student, if anything, I'm taught it's not for me to have an agenda for how other people run their lives or careers. But I mean, do you <clears throat> do you see a hope for us getting? people in politics that have those well, oh, ideals. Oh, absolutely. I yeah. think the Bernie Sanders uh, uh, movement has absolutely proven that. Uh, I know I paid my $27 a month that, you know, to be in that continuing, what do you call it, our revolution? Um, absolutely. And even though I don't see myself running again, you know, I think that if I hadn't run already, I'd probably be signing up to run now. So I hope absolutely that more and more people will run. Um, Absolutely, and I'm, I'm here to help in any way I can, uh, and we'll continue, absolutely. I think that this country is um, in a, obviously a very, very critical place. But I think that one of, you know, there's a line in the Bible, what man intends for evil, God intends for good. And I think that even with some of the things going on in our politics today, um, I think there is an awakening going on because I think many people are seeing things that they hadn't looked at. A lot of people are realizing the hour is later than we had thought. A lot of people are realizing, you know, I really kind of do like living in a country that works 
basically fairly, <laughs> uh, you know? And I, so I, I have hope, and if you look, and I'm a romantic about American democracy. I'm a romantic about the journey of our country. And even though our country has, in many ways, at many times, transgressed against the principles upon which we ourselves purport to stand, starting with slavery and genocide of Native Americans and so forth, our tendency has been over time to self-correct. So as horrible as some of our transgressions have been, in every one of them, generations have arisen and put this country back on track. So the only issue, you know, when people say, oh, it's so hard. Well, it wasn't exactly easy to abolish slavery. It wasn't exactly easy to get women the right to vote. The issue is let us not wimp out on the job that other generations have done. That's the real question. What do you mean it's not easy? You think it was easy for them? You think it was easy for those generations who confronted things every bit as dark and horrifying as this? Now, they didn't have cell phones, you know. So, so do I think, I, I do, I think it's in our DNA, you know. Um, Winston Churchill said, you can always count on Americans to do the right thing after they have exhausted every other option. <laughs> you know, the, the entire world, the entire world uh, practically, many, many people around the world roll their eyes about America uh, and just kind of can't even believe uh, about us sometimes. But those people also know that when we do waken, we slam it like nobody's business. <laughs> and I just hope we slam it like nobody's business in November. And beyond, and beyond. So these are not, these are not, uh, these are not easy times. Our politics today is clearly not, you know, it's not like these are the good guys and these are the bad guys. It's not that simple. It's all very complicated. Each of us has to make decisions in our own hearts. Um, I think that what we have, to, um, we have to all be very clear about is to be sophisticated, nuanced thinkers at this time. In politics, you're not going to get everything you want um, necessarily at any one time. It's a process. But I think even that, I think what's going on right now is making a lot of us, I think a lot of what's going on right now, even with this election, is making a lot of people wake up from this kind of slumber. Um, so I, 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 I bet on America, that I, I don't count us out. I, if you look at American history, um, we sometimes take a while to get there, but uh, we are a good and we are a decent people. And we, we show that ultimately. That's how I feel. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so my question is, I love this idea about our individualized curriculum. Yes, that's what the course says. It, each of us has a highly individualized curriculum. Right. So <clears throat> what happens is that I end up going through my day or meeting people and saying, I wonder if I'm, what I'm supposed to learn from this person and from this person and from this person. And I wonder if that's a ploy of the ego or if that's, you know, like, Everybody I meet or everything I go through, I try to well, see Well, it's the not so is. much that you have to ask the specific. You know, the Course in Miracles says, words are at best but symbols. So it's not about what am I supposed to learn here. It is about if I'm happy and, I'm, uh, and I am at peace, I have learned. The Course in Miracles says, the way you know is by whether or not you are at peace. And if you are not at peace, there's something you're still not getting. So the only real issue is, the only real thing to learn, and in every moment there is an invitation to be the higher version of yourself. And the highest version of yourself is the full embodiment of the Christ, your Christ itself, by whatever name you call it. The Buddha mind, the Shekinah, every different religious systems have different names, but the point is the full love which is within you. And the Course in Miracles says about Jesus, for instance, is that he was in a state which is potential in us. He doesn't, he said, I don't have anything you don't have. The difference between us is I don't have anything else. In other words, the perfect mind of love is in you, just as it was in Buddha, Jesus, whomever. The difference is you and I have all this other stuff that fog it up. So this person is maybe sent to me just to learn how to be peaceful. And well, I learned can that you the give a, is person. there a specific you want to give an example? Well, I just recently started to date somebody new. Oh, that's a lesson. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's high, that's high level intense curriculum. Okay, tell us all about it. <laughs> um, no, so it, 
it's like, I don't, you know, it's, I don't feel at peace all the time. Like, I'm like, am I supposed to learn communication with him? Am I supposed to learn this with him? You know, what am I supposed to be learning? You know, love is an art. You know, sometimes people in our society today take better care of their cars <laughs> than they take care of their relationships. You know, learning how to really care for a relationship, learning the art of love. You know, we just expect it to just, well, a perfect relationship is where you do everything I want you to do when I want you to do it. That's the ego's mind of a perfect relationship. The Course in Miracles talks about the ego wants what the Course calls a special relationship. And the Holy Spirit, the Course says, wants what the Course calls the holy relationship. The special relationship is what my ego has in mind. My ego's idea of a great relationship, a special relationship, is that you fit my pictures. I have a frame, and I'm just looking for someone to fit into my frame. And that frame has to do with all the things that I think I didn't get in my life, so I need you to be. So I have a core belief that I'm lacking something, or my life is lacking something, and I want you to come in there and fill it. So I'm not, the Course says, I don't really love you. I'm seeking to rob you, <laughs> right? And in fact, once you give it to me, I'm probably done with you anyway. And the Course in Miracles says that that frame where the ego is trying to get someone to come in and fill that frame, it says that that frame is made of gold, and that gold is a very fancy frame with diamonds and rubies. And it says those diamonds are your tears, and that those rubies are your blood. And what it is, is I don't really want to see the real you. I'm not interested in seeing the real you. My ego mind doesn't let me know this, but I'm looking for someone to fit in that picture. Now, if I see your weakness then, you've ruined it. So I don't really want to see you, and I don't want you to see me. Because if you see the real me, I'm assuming you would reject me, just as I would reject you if I saw the real you. And that's a dance of pain. And it's where I have a notion of how you need to be. And if you think about it, we don't have an agenda like for anyone the way we have an agenda for people that we are close to in an intimate relationship. Right? Now, a holy relationship is something else entirely. A holy relationship is the special relationship when it has been given to God. Given a relationship to the Holy Spirit. And when do you do that? The moment you meet the person. Dear God, you know as well as I do, I can be neurotic in this area more than in any other area. Please take this from me. That which you put on the altar is then altered. The altar is within your mind. If you're attracted to that person, you know, it's like in the Greek <clears throat> mythology of Cupid, Cupid's bow and arrow. That's important because if, 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 if I wasn't attracted to you, my attraction to you is spirit's way of saying, there's something to be learned here. Otherwise, I wouldn't know to slow down. But the ego would take that and turn it into the dance of death because the ego knows that if we get holy with each other, we're going to know God. And the ego is all about repudiating that. So in the holy relationship, it is understood. You are wounded and I am wounded. Now remember, the universe is intentional. The universe's intention is that you become enlightened, the universe intention is that I become enlightened. But as I said earlier tonight, the Course says, you can't bring the light to the darkness, you have to bring the darkness to the light. We heal through a kind of detox. So a great relationship is not one in which your childhood issues aren't, don't come up and my childhood issues don't come up. By definition, it is a place where not immediately, because it would make us leave, but when it's time, <laughs> your issues will come up and my issues will come up because it's this detox. So the holy relationship is this hospital for the soul, where it is understood. Remember, where you're wounded, where you're neurotic, is not where you're bad, it's where you're wounded. So when the other person's issues come up, your ego is going to want to blame them. That's the whole point here. Seek, but do not, do not find. Whereas what's happening is they're showing you their wound, and you are showing them your wound. Their ego will say, obviously, this is the wrong relationship for me. Your ego will probably say, this is the wrong relationship, one or the other. But the spirit, you know, I, I've certainly been in times, this is terrible. And I feel like God's going, oh, this is good. <laughs> okay. You know, because the ego says, this is awful. Is sometimes that's when the detox is coming up. So people who are trained know that this is where 
through the practice of one person willing to own. So I would say to you, uh, this, whatever that is, it is a problem for me, that you're willing to own it, and we're both willing to own our part, and we're both willing to practice mercy, compassion, and non-judgment toward the other. Now, some of the most painful things are that you don't get to make the other person's decision for them. So sometimes you might feel, I think we could make this work if we stay, and the other person just doesn't want to. You can't control that. But if you are at that point of, of learning those lessons, that is what you will attract. So absolutely. You know, sometimes what the ego would like to say is that here's your spiritual life, and here are all these other categories, including your love life. But actually your intimate life, no place are these lessons more intense than in that area where you are tempted to have an agenda for another person, where you are tempted to run your own games, your own neuroses come up. You don't, if, you, if you just take a good look at your life, do you ever mess up so much as you mess up around the people you most want to get it right with? Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's why we study these things, and that's why you're here, and that's why we study all the wonderful material, people who write books about these things and about spirituality. That's why we're all here. So where do deal breakers come in? Pardon? Where do deal breakers come in? Deal breakers, well, there are certain obvious deal breakers, such as physical violence, obviously, right. is, a, is a complete deal breaker. It, sometimes the lesson in a relationship is stay here. Don't leave. Don't, don't run. Sometimes the lesson in a relationship is leave now. And there's no outer guidebook. You... Um, other, the Course in Miracles does say the Holy Spirit speaks to you through your brothers. You talk to friends. You talk to counselors. But ultimately, you know, the Course in Miracles says you are to make no decisions for yourself, but the Holy Spirit guides you. Ultimately, it's your own internal guidance. In this, as in all things, what is your will for me? Does that make sense? Anybody else have any, while we're on that topic, any other love questions? Yes, ma'am. Do you want to talk about that? Yes. Okay, good. Yes. Okay. Oh, thank you. My question is in turn, I'm a mother, so how does that translate to the love of little ones? And doing, like for example, for me, a big challenge is like when they're not around, when they're asleep, and I meditate, and I feel like spiritually strong and grounded, and then the day happens, and then there, you know, there are moments when I'm doing my best to be calm, and then that last door, and then I'm ah, like that, just screaming and so upset, and, and I try to bring groundedness, or, or like I know I love them, but then there's just these moments where it's just overwhelming. Well, and, unlike with and, a man, it is not an option to leave. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And then, and then also one thing that I hear over and over again, and they're small, but one thing that's on my mind a lot, because you hear people talk about your childhood dramas, like traumas. I'm like, I'm causing so much childhood trauma. Oh, child listen, I used, to, I, remember I used to be driving along with my daughter, and I turned around and go, are you having a happy childhood? <laughs> I used to say that to all of them, because they will ask you. Yeah. I used to say to her all the time, are you having a happy childhood? <laughs> So, but I can also tell you, <laughs> oh, you are? I mean, is it happy? Are you generally happy? Um, I, I, I don't know anybody. I've never met anyone whose child reached, let's say, 20 or 21 and say, wow, I got everything right. So that's first of all. How old are your children? Six and four. Are you and single or are you with? I'm, I'm married. Okay. Yeah. So you, what, you have two little boys? Two little, two little boys. Two, how, how did I guess? <laughs> Two little boys, yeah. Because <laughs> I can't even imagine. <clears throat> well, as your, as your, first of all, you're not going to so, get, once again, everything right. And I'm yeah, sure that, so, that raising two little boys, all that, that's right. a lot of testosterone in your house. Right, and it's like, because I am on this path of, of, of learning discipline around my spirituality, right. there's also this fine line of wanting to do it right. But then I'm not perfect. And then I beat myself up But what up is it that it. you think of as you're and not doing right with your boys? I just, I, I, I try to be loving and, but then I turn into this evil monster, like, when Do you really? No, pushed. seriously, do you really? Do you really like 
go over a line and like yeah. scream at them or something? Yeah. No, that's not okay. So you want to get exactly. help on that. It's yeah. not okay. No, that's but not okay. But when I'm like right. grounded and stuff, I'm like right. really cool. Right, right, right. So but it's like there, those, yeah. Right. So there are many books. You do not want to be a screamer at your children. Yeah. You absolutely do not. Yeah. So there are many books about such things. There are many support groups and right. systems. So what I acknowledge you for is recognizing that you go over a line. Yeah. And you're right, you don't want your little six and four right. year old to experience that from yeah. mommy, yeah. okay? So whether it has to do with you and your husband and you and your, in that relationship or you're seeing someone, mm -hmm. I acknowledge you for recognizing that is over the line. Right. And it might even be that someone here tonight, when you leave, someone might come up to you, tell you about a group that they go to or a book that they know. Okay. Uh, in the meantime, let's pray for you and any other parent who, who needs help. What is your name? Nicole. Nicole, let's pray. And this is for all parents. And of course, we all want to get it right. And nobody's going to get it right all the time. But I really acknowledge Nicole because if you're screaming at a four-year-old and a six-year-old, I acknowledge her for saying, no, that, that, that is going over the line. I mean, every once in a while you blow up or whatever. But if you feel that you're a screamer at a six and four-year-old, um, I acknowledge that. So the point is, anything you acknowledge as a problem, once again, he says in The Course in Miracles, I cannot take from you what you will not release to me. So the reason I acknowledge Nicole is we often want to keep at bay the realization of where our behavior needs work. Once you are willing to acknowledge my behavior needs work, then it is as simple as, dear God, I am willing to change. Please teach me. You know, sometimes people will say something like, well, I need to work that out, work that through. It's actually more kind of radically simple than that. Dear God, take this from me. Now, you are going to, the things that trigger you, that you would want to scream at really little ones, they will come up. But what's going to happen is that because of this prayer, even if your behavior is the same, you're going to know. You're going to know this is not how I want to be. Now, after this prayer, you will notice things online. Like I said, people might mention things to you. Books will fall at your feet. You'll find yourself at a library, at a bookstore, things, the answers will, spirit, God will do his part if you'll do yours. And the point is you're saying, this is a problem. I have a problem in this area. You know what mine was when I was, uh, had a really young one, was I think, you know, talking about intimate relationships, I noticed that any, I played out the same thing with her. I, I kept, when she was really little, there was a little bit of emotional distance. I found motherhood overwhelming. I felt I was being smothered by it. And then I found that a, a lot of mothers feel that way. I remember a book I read called Surrender to Motherhood. Because it is overwhelming. But, and it's overwhelming in a way that doesn't fit in with the new sort of corporatized order of how we're supposed to live. And we have all this ridiculous notion of how a woman should be able to just kind of fit that in with everything else she's doing. That's why things like family leave are so important. Because our society does not now organize itself in a way that gives a woman permission to surrender into it. And that's why financial inequality, economic inequality is so important because people who are totally stressed financially have a harder time being there for their spouses, their lovers, and their children. Living in survival makes it difficult for you to show up in your relationships, right? But once again, you look at these things and you ask. So this is the prayer for the parents. Let's all pray. <clears throat> and also, for those of you who are single or do not have children, and you think about people that might have occurred to you just in the last five minutes, wow, that's like my friend so-and-so. She's really overwhelmed with her kids. I've seen her yell or whatever. You might think, wow, you know, there are times when I could offer to take, you know, Dylan for a movie on Saturday. All of us are responsible for the children. Does that make sense? Okay, let's pray. <clears throat> Dear God, for those of us who are parents, and for all of us really, teach us and show us and guide us that we might be most responsible for the children in our midst. We join with Nicole as she places in your hands her motherhood, places in your hands her relationship with her two sons. 
May the Holy Spirit come upon her home and her family, her marriage, her relationship with her husband, their relationship with their children. Please send to Nicole every thought, every friend, every book, every anything by which you guide her to the light, to the peace, to the placement of her motherhood and her relationship with her children, which is a divinely illumined expression of motherhood at its best. All of us surrender, whether it's fatherhood, motherhood, our relationships to our grandchildren, godchildren, nieces or nephews. Open our eyes that this part of our lives might become illumined and no longer kept in shadows. And so it is, together, we all say, amen. Nicole, what religion were you brought up? Go to Mary. She's in charge of mothers and children. You light a candle and you ask her to overshadow your motherhood. The religion of your childhood is where you knew God in your most innocent. Okay. All right. Yes, I want to go to somebody that hasn't asked because I want to, I'm, uh, there are a few people. Yes, ma'am. This lady right here. <clears throat> Hi. Um, I'm curious about when your ego starts to die or dissipate yeah. or whatever you want to call it, what kind of effects start to happen? So in my personal life, I've been noticing that I'm just crying for no reason. And I wonder if that's part well, of... Well, crying for no reason may or may not be ego. And that's what I talk about in my book, In Tears to Triumph, you know. Sometimes, you know, this thing about how it's bad to cry. Notice everybody's doing muscle testing. And everybody's talking about the genius of the body. So why, if we think the body is such a genius, do we not apply that to how many tears we cry? Tears are important. We've come up with this total poppycock recently in our society. If you cry this long, it's normal. If you cry longer than that, you might need something. <laughs> wink, wink. Fill the multi-billion dollar coffers of an industry that's making a profit center off your suffering. If you have 45 tears to cry, crying 17 is not enough. So sometimes tears, tears are fascinating. Tears, sometimes, you, you know what they used to say? You need to cry it out. So the fact that you are crying may or may not mean that that's an ego state. Does that make sense? But I'm wondering if, it, uh, if that can be an effect of the ego dying, like there's a letting go of the ego and maybe grieving what Those was are there. words no. and... Just you know, crying. Every moment, yeah. I, you know, we, how, how could I know what your particular tears at any particular time represent? And all of us, the ego is dying and the spirit is being born every moment of our lives. Does that make sense? Yes. But I would definitely seek a deeper knowing, which your subconscious can tell you, why am I crying? And I think for those, when you start a spiritual path, becoming very emotional sometimes is is, if we, you know, we live, we've put ourselves in our society over the last few years in these corporatized boxes. You know, we used to make fun of Stepford wives, and now we're all trying to become more Stepford. <laughs> you know, this, like, box. And if you're outside the box, there's something wrong. And so all of us have these pent-up emotions and deeper layers of things. And when spirit comes into your life, yes, yeah, sometimes you get emotional. Because you haven't, because it's all these uncried tears and unfelt feelings that we didn't know where to put because we're all trying to be so functional. Does that make sense? And that's why trying to short circuit that experience is so dysfunctional. Does that make sense? Definitely. Okay, who's next? No men have spoken. Any men have anything you want to say? Okay, yes sir, back there. Uh, thank you so much for the... Uh the lecture. I'm very new to this whole thing, um, but I found it really informative. Um, and I have a feeling that the answer is probably going to be do the Course in Miracles. But um, <laughs> I'm just curious um, because Thomas More talking about the ego, um, you know, acknowledging that it's responsible for a lot of fear and a lot of the unhappiness in the world also says that it gets, you know, a bad rap, that it has its place. Um, it's, 
gone haywire and been completely misused, but is the idea here to completely reject, kill, destroy the ego, or find its proper place at the table? Okay, okay, thank you. First of all, I adore Thomas More. Yeah, so you, that issue that you just pointed out is a semantic difference. Okay. He is using the word differently than The Course in Miracles uses it. The Course in Miracles uses the word ego the way the ancient Greeks used it. It is the illusion of a small separated self. So from A Course in Miracles perspective, there's no such thing as the good uses of the ego. Now, I used to have a therapist who would talk about the negative ego and the positive ego. That's more what, how Thomas More is using the word. But the ego as I am using it, or as A Course in Miracles uses it, there's no such thing as a little bit of good cancer. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It is the mind gone crazy, like a cancer cell. The cancer cell is a cell that has disconnected from its natural intelligence and forgotten that its purpose is to collaborate with the other cells to serve the healthy functioning of the whole. And it goes off to do its own thing, which is destructive. It builds a mass, a kingdom of its own. And that malignancy is what has happened to the human race. We have been infected with a malignant consciousness. So if you have cancer surgery, the doctor doesn't say, good news, we got most of it out. <laughs> you know, if there's any left, there's a problem because it continues to grow. That's just a different use of the word. The way, the way Thomas is, is using the word, the, it would be more a conversation almost like healthy versus unhealthy masculine. Mm -hmm. Healthy versus un imbalanced mas masculine. Masculine untempered by relational concern. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, in using like the cancer terminology, where did that uh, cell mutation happen? That's the question he asked. In, in that moment, that cell mutation was the moment of the separation, the detour into fear. It happened, that was that primal moment. And the, uh, it's so interesting that this actually matches what science says about the Big Bang because it says it happened in an instant, in time as we know it. And all jokes aside, it is exactly what he asked. Where did it come from? Well, we have complete freedom. And it was a moment when the Son of God forgot to laugh. But the point is not millions of years ago fixing it. The point is that it's reenacted because there is no time. So in any moment when we choose love over fear, we are closing the gap and the separation no longer exists. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yes, this lady here. I just have a book recommendation for Nicole. Great. And it's here, so just want to give it to her. Okay, Raising Our Children, Raising Ourselves by Naomi Adler. And this lady's card, and this is a recommendation to you. And there are all kinds of books about spirituality and child raising and stuff like that. It's that, the... <laughs> See how it works? <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marianne. Um, I had a question about... Uh, turn this way so people can okay. see you on camera. Um, I'm, a lot of pain comes up for me around the way animals are treated. Yes. There's a lot of... Sla yeah, we're horrified by yes. slavery. We're horrified by yes. what's going on in the world yes. of people. Yes. But the way our animals are treated, yes. factory farming, yes. exploitation, abuse, right. and and I do what I can in my life, right. and I feel like it's not enough. Okay. And I don't want to be in a place of judgment either. Okay. Of people who choose to wear leather and eat meat right. and all of that. Right. So Although how you are, obviously. Myself. Right, I yeah. guess. <laughs> yes, because I feel like there's so much suffering. There was a big just wink, today, wink there, yeah. Just okay. today I saw on Facebook that there are men going to South Africa, African safaris just to shoot animals. Yeah. And that... It's, yes, it's correct. horrifying. It's barbaric. Okay, so first of all, it, it's no either or. Uh, it's not like any form of suffering matters more or less than another. But I actually don't agree with you 
that there is so much talking about human suffering. There are uh, 12,000 children who starve on this planet every single day, every four seconds. And to be honest, I hear more people going on about animals than I hear people going on about starving children. I think it's all equally. Well, I'm not, well, whether you think it's equally or not, my point is that I think that there is a rising movement. I think that many people on the earth today do have, uh, as you're saying, um, a greater and greater concern about this. I think, uh, uh, and, and, and you're right about factory farming. You're right about cockfighting and puppy mills and all kinds of horrible things. And it is a rise in consciousness. And when you say you don't know what you can do, there are actually a lot of organizations that are at work on this. Things like the Humane Society. I, um, I, do, I am part yeah. of a lot. And I, yeah. I, I, well, I think that there are, you know, I'm on the Faith Advisory Council for them. And there are amazing uh, agendas of legislation that have to do with those things that I just mentioned. The factory farming, the cockfighting, the puppy mills. And I think more and more people are becoming vegan, more and more people are following their uh, conscience in relation to this that may or may not agree with you in every way. But in any situation, none of us, one person, is going to fix the whole thing. That's just not the way change How happens. How do you not get overwhelmed by By, by that? not thinking that you're that big a deal. <laughs> you know, none of us are indispensable. You know, it's like the story of the little boy with the starfish. He throws one starfish into, back into the sea. And somebody comes up and says, honey, there's so many starfish. You know, you can't make a difference for all these starfish. And he said, well, it made a difference to that one starfish. Mm -hmm. Right? You know, I was once, I'll tell you a story. I was invited to a conference that the Humane Society put on. A faith advisory council for the Humane Society about puppy mills, cockfighting, and factory farming. And I, was, I found myself at this day-long conference in Washington, D.C. with the highest, and I mean the highest of the highest, of conservative Christian leadership in this country. The head of the, you know, Baptist Convention, the head of the Moral Majority. I mean, these, the guys you see on TV, right? They were kind of wondering what I was doing there. I was kind of wondering what I was doing there. <laughs> and it was the most well done convention, a conference I have ever attended. This is what they did. If you were to say, how many of you believe that the same spirit of God is in you? The same spirit of God in you is in the animals. How many of you believe that? Okay. For many of us, that's not a, because the Course says all living things. To the conservative traditional Christians that I was with that day, that is blasphemous. However, what they do believe because the Bible tells them is that God told us to be good stewards of the animals. So this was so interesting to me, because if the Humane Society, the people who put this conference together were so smart, they knew that if they had come at this like the same spirit of God, as, then those people would just sit there and bristle. But instead, they had all these people, and they were reading like scholars and people like C.S. Lewis, who was big on the animals, all these Christian um, uh, writers and places from the Bible where they say this. Okay? And they're just amazing stuff. And actually, I learned that day how many of these, these traditional Christian churches have bring your dog to uh, church day, day and all these things about caring for their animals. And these people who were coming at it from a conservative Christian perspective where they did not believe that the same uh, spirit was in, but that God did tell us to be good stewards of the animals, then after all this was well established, the Humane Society showed us films. And I saw those little razors that they use. They passed them around in cockfights, in the puppy mills, and they showed us films. And I, I saw these people who I might have had some judgment of in certain ways before that conference, and they were, they were crying. Everybody in that room was crying. And then this is what I saw, that you talk about my running for office, because I went, God, why don't we have that? This is what happened. After these people who had been told that God told us to be good stewards of the animals were shown the things you're talking about, about factory farming, about uh, puppy mills, about all that stuff, put out, they put out a big map. And these were the leaders of the top 
traditional conservative Christian organizations in this country were around the map and the Humane Society explained, we need this law to change in this state, we need this law to change in this state, because you know how in every area the states get around things by making something a misdemeanor, <clears throat> and what's really going on is cockfighting, but it's all behind that, and the police know, but they can't get it, so this law has to be changed in this law, and these guys were over the map, and they were going like this, and they were totally on board for everything you'd want, because God told us we have to be, and they were going, and I watched these guys, man, they were powerhouses, okay, who do we have in uh, North Carolina? Call so-and-so, call that congressman, call. Who do we have, who did John get on the phone? Okay, call Senator Allen right now, we got somebody. And it was unbelievable how well organized these people were. You know, we, we're critical sometimes, but on that, it was amazing to see. I, I remember when I left there that day, it was kind of shaking. I was amazed because they had been moved and they were on it and they had offices and they had lobbying, was, okay, get. And these guys were calling like senators. And Congress people, they weren't calling lower people. Okay, who's in, uh, who's in Dakota? We got, you, okay, call so-and-so, get them on the phone for me. It was amazing. So I think that things on the animal thing is changing in many different areas. And no matter what it is, once again, you, you look at history. And this is where we, and you see this sometimes with some of these people, but I say this with all due respect, some of the Bernie and Buss and stuff. Some people seem to think, I should get what I want when I want it. And we should get what we want in one election cycle. And nobody got what they wanted in one election cycle. You know, you didn't get what you wanted. Civil rights legislation didn't come through one election cycle. Abolition didn't come through one election cycle. Uh, suffrage, suffrage didn't come through one election cycle. Gay marriage didn't come through one election cycle. But you get in there, and you never know where you're going to be. Uh, it's like on an assembly line. We all want to be, I want to be there at the very end when everything's done. And sometimes that's not the moment you're going to be. I remember once I was going through something with a man and my girlfriend said to me, Marianne, he is going to get it. But not today and not from you. <laughs> right? So you do your part. None of us are indispensable. But you never know the part you might be playing. And the more you practice your own work, and that would include, and I say this with great respect, and I have some very close friends, Kathy Freston is one of my closest friends and stuff, <clears throat> and she, she is completely beautiful on this issue, so I'm not at all using her as an example. But some people in that movement are very judgmental of those who wear leather, very judgmental of those, and that, that will only stymie your ability to be effective. Martin Luther King said, you have very little morally persuasive power with people who can feel your underlying contempt. So the primary responsibility of the miracle worker is to practice the atonement for him or herself. For your first job is, dear God, please take away from me my judgment of people who do not see it the way I do. Please take away my judgment of people who eat meat. Please take away my judgment of people who wear leather because with that person they will subconsciously know I judge them. I will have no morally persuasive power. Does that make sense? You do your work first, but clearly, just like every cell is assigned, this cell's assigned to the liver, this cell's assigned to the heart, this cell's assigned to the bones, you were assigned to animals. Everybody's assigned to different parts of the revolution. You, you're assigned to the environment. How do I know? Because that's where your passion is. You, you're assigned to, uh, to uh, sex trafficking. How do I know? Because that's where your passion is. Wherever your passion is, that's your assignment. And then this whole political stuff, we have some collective assignments. Does that make sense? Okay, all right, let's uh, say our final prayer. Thank you. <clears throat> Were you out of town? We missed you. I want to thank all of you for being here. We will be here next Wednesday, God willing, as my mother said. Um, anything else we need to, are we all done for the evening? Are we cool? All right. <clears throat> Please join with me. Dear God, we take this moment to send our love and our peace to each other. We pray for Jay, Sarah, Susie. We pray for Mike and Monica. Monica, I saw your letter. There is no way that being in that relationship with this man in your home can fill the purposes of the Holy Spirit. And that is my truth. Match it with your own. 
and do as God guides you. But we do place the marriage of Monica and Mike in the hands of God. We pray for Jim Sr. We pray for James and for Robert, for Sabina and Joe, for Lenny, for Rebecca. We pray for Dana, for Jessica, for Harriet, for Kim and Tracy, for Nicole, for Yuri, and for Kim. All of us now place in the hands of God everything we think of as our burden, our decision to be made, as well as our visions and our hopes and our dreams. We place in the hands of God our precious planet. We place in the hands of God our animals and all their needless suffering. We place in the hands of God the needless suffering of so many people in this world. We pray for those who live lives of agony and fear and even torture. And for those who have been lost in the darkness of their own hate, dear God, place your hand upon them. Send angels, legions of angels, to minister unto people who are lost in philosophies of hate, captured by dark and hateful ideologies. Send your angels to minister unto them, and we look into their hearts right now and remind them that we are brothers through the grace of God, through the power of God, awaken and rejoin the brotherhood of Christ. May a great wave of love and forgiveness be upon all the nations of the world. Those of us who are Americans also pray for our political campaign. May a great light pour forth upon this nation and upon all nations. And now go forth in confidence and go forth in peace. For there are angels to our left and there are angels to our right. There are angels in front of us and angels behind us. Angels above us and angels below. Wherever you go, God goes with you, for God is in your mind. If at any moment you feel lost and confused and cannot find the path of light God has placed before you, Put out your hand as does a little child looking for an elder brother to take your hand and guide your footsteps. Such is no idle fantasy. He is here. And so it is, together, we all say, Amen. God bless you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.